Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the NBA Front Office Show. Trevor Lane here, joined by Keith Smith at Keith Smith NBA. You can find me at Trevor underscore Lane. We are, man, the clock is ticking. We're almost there. We're almost back to actual basketball on the court. Can you can you believe it? We've spent all offseason talking about moves and rumors and trades and free agency and all kinds of stuff. We're almost to a point where we get to see real basketball back on the floor. I can't wait. Keith, how are you doing? Yeah, man, two weeks from today, we're recording this on Thursday the 15th, we will go to bed knowing that there will be hoops the next day. And it'll be early. It'll be 6 a.m. Eastern uh, basketball. Warriors Wizards from Japan is going to kick us off on the 30th. But, but yeah, we're, we're less than two weeks, a week and a half from media day. I think we're only like a week from training camps opening for those teams that are playing overseas. They get a few days jump. So, yeah, we're, we're almost there. It's a, I tweeted uh, – my, my friends at Celtics blog tweeted out, we're 17 days away from the Celtics first preseason game. And I tweeted out a gift saying so close yet. So far, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, will you be watching live that very first preseason game? So that's, a tricky question. I am usually up right around six. We that's okay. usually when we get up to like get things started to get moving uh, for the day. So we'll see. There's a chance I may I may tune in live, but I'm going to record it and then after I do school drop off and stuff, I'll come home and watch it. Because I mean, what else am I going to do in you know in the morning when I get home? It's a uh, it's that's one of my favorite things to do is record games and then watch them in the morning while I'm uh, setting up my day. So get the process started in just a couple weeks. See, I am very much a night owl, which, you know, given the, you know, the Lakers, they typically play the later games in the day too, like that obviously is a factor, but, uh, but I just naturally, I'm a night owl. In fact, when I was growing up, my my parents called me the Johnny Carson kid because <laughs> I was always awake, like when Johnny Carson was on, which is the, you know, the late show, but. Um, well, you but, just dated us right there. Right. Like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And most people watching, who's Johnny Carson? Yeah, right. <laughs> but. but in any event, like I, that's kind of my default is I'm a, I'm a night owl. So a 6 a.m. game to me means I'm talking about a few hours of sleep. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull that off for, for <laughs> Warriors versus Wizards. I'm going to try to be optimistic and say that I will find some way to power through, but no promises on that. Yeah, that, that it's it's funny too because that's one where like let's see who even plays right in that first preseason game. There usually is pressure to play the stars at least a little bit because they are overseas and those kind of things. But yeah, it's it's a but I mean the main takeaway we are really really close. Now. That's right. We're we're almost there. That's right. Uh, we are going to talk about the Utah Jazz today. We have some fresh rumors about them, the trade front, kind of what things are look like for them. But before we get to that, we have a few news topics that we do need to get into. We're also going to talk a little bit about Exhibit 10 contracts and how that works because we're hearing a lot about those right now, and we're going to continue to hear about them as we get into preseason play. But first, we have to start things off with obviously an incredibly negative story, um, and that is Robert Sarver being suspended and fined by the NBA, uh, a lot of the there's a lot of backlash, but it's not backlash necessarily just against Sarver. It's backlash against the NBA for not having a stiffer punishment here. What is it? It's ten million dollar fine, one year suspension for him. He can't do anything in an official capacity for the Phoenix Suns. And of course, all of this stems from the allegations that were against him that he said and did some pretty terrible things. Mm -hmm. are, are you surprised when you saw what came out of the NBA's investigation that the punishment wasn't, wasn't harsher? I'm not. The 10 million is the max that can be uh, levied at any one time in terms of a fine that, that was upped from about, I want to say it was 2 million prior uh, to this. So they, they did agree the board of governors to up that, uh, you know, one, one transgression. And I, and I know calling this one thing, cause it wasn't one thing. It was many, many things over the course of years, yeah. but it was one thing in terms of, uh, this one investigation that they did. Um, but it was, that's the max. So that part, the one year suspension, I, I'm going to say this and then I'll clarify what I mean. They were never going to give him a lifetime ban. Um, I know that happened with Donald Sterling, mm -hmm. but there's some important context to remember here. And I'm by no means excusing, ex excusing Robert Sarver. Cause mm -hmm. my belief is a ban would have been perfectly fine. I'm just saying what, was never on the table was that was Donald Sterling had 30 plus years of 
all sorts of horrible, horrible behavior towards people, uh, towards the the employees that worked for him, the players, uh, towards just general people in you know in the world um, that weren't in the basketball life with him. He also did things like moved to the Clippers to L.A. without permission uh, from the league and just then took the uh, what at the time was a massive fine for doing so. So there were a lot of things where he had run. They, they really should be forced to move them back. Right. I think. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but there's some who I think think they should be moved all the way back to Buffalo. Yeah, uh, you know, per, I'm okay Mark with that. Stein, Whatever. Our, our, our <laughs> friend Mark Stein, who uh, is a big Buffalo Braves guy, but you know, it is one of those things when I look at this, and it is the banning of an owner is something that it's 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 going to have to take years and years of stuff. Should it? Probably not. Right? There should be things that should get you there. But the reality is, if we remember back to when Donald Sterling was banned, there were owners at the time who said, I don't know about this. This is a slippery slope. Mark Cuban among them. Mm -hmm. Um, That was very kind of not, I don't want to say critical, but just not totally sure that that's the way it should go. Getting 29 owners, you have to get three quarters of majority to ban him for life, to really force him into selling the team. That was never going to happen here because there's a whole bunch of owners who are going to say, uh, I don't need to be throwing rocks when I live in a glass house too. Um, right. You know, well, no, I'm not saying all of them across the board, but we know there's bad behavior because we get enough of these stories every year. So that's why he was never going to be banned. So that part didn't surprise me. What has surprised me since then was the way the NBA has handled it basically since the punishment came down, including Adam Silver's press conference uh, yesterday at the Board of Governors meeting. That was uh, about as poorly handled a presser as I think I've ever seen. What what did you particularly not like about the the press the way Silver responded? I know they had to come back afterwards and clarify some of the things that he said because some of them did come across a little tone deaf. Yeah, his um, there were two parts that that particularly bothered me. The part which they clarified where he said, "Oh," and I'm very much paraphrasing, but it's right. owners are held to a different standard than players, and right? Did that. And owners have rights to do and say things. And I was like, that doesn't. If anything, they should be held to a different standard on the other side yes. right we should expect more of them if they're going to be the ones who are this group of 30 that own that they own the uh really own and run uh the nba but the other part that really bothered me was his statement and again i'm paraphrasing but robert sarver has evolved a lot and, and a lot of people had really nice things to say to him that that you know i don't want to make anything political here but that's what whatever you know side you look at this that's the there's a lot of good people on both sides of an argument thing and it's like eh, we don't that just didn't need to be said you know that's not like because to there you're to me you're you're almost excusing away some of his bad behavior by saying well you know some people really like him and say is he a good guy like you can find i'm sure in almost any walk of life people who will who will defend someone Right. Like well, in, in our family, one of the sayings is, you know, if, if I was ever on trial for like axe murdering, my mom would be like, well, they shouldn't have been standing where he was swinging that axe because my mom <laughs> would defend me to the end. But it's like, you know, but most people are like, uh, yeah, I don't defend that baby. That part part left me feeling a little cold. Mm-hmm. Um, I just and I is normally Adam Silver's pretty. He feels like he's polished, but in a relatable way in these pressers. Like he doesn't feel like he's talking down to you and those kind of things. This one, he just seemed almost like he was caught off guard. Like these questions uh, weren't anticipated or expected. And I'm not sure why, right? I think you would have to go into that knowing you were going to get hammered on that. And to the point of, I did not watch the entire thing, but it seemed like that was all that was really discussed uh, throughout the course of the, the presser. Well, I'll say this. I, I I don't recall who said this. Uh, otherwise, I'd, I'd give them credit for it. But someone mentioned on, on the Twitterverse that um, their takeaway from the interview was that it, it was a reminder that Adam Silver works for yep. NBA owners and not mm-hmm. the other way around. And I, I do I do get where you could walk away from that press conference with that, getting that sense from from the things that he that he said, um, obviously you don't want to try to excuse anything that that Robert Sarver said that he did any of that uh, this terrible terrible stuff that's that was uh, that was happening here. And so I think the fine was. I mean, look, people say, oh, that's a slap on the wrist for him, but really, like when we talk about people with that much money, like for the normal, per- like it's almost hard to wrap our brains around how much money they have. Like that mm-hmm. number could be just about anything, and people will say, oh, well, to him, that's a slap on the wrist. Sure. 
right? Like that's, so, I mean, look, to me, I look I'm like $10 million is a lot of money. I don't care who yeah. you are. $10, $10 million is a lot. I'll never have of, that much money. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. It's, it's a lot of, of money, but I also think there's this, you, know, you mentioned that other owners around the league were, were hesitant to ban Sterling and to some degree, because they were like, well, you know, Hey, my past isn't all that squeaky clean. I don't have that kind of money, so I can't say with any kind of certainty, but my expectation would be that when you have the kind of money those people have, you tend to feel empowered to do things that other people simply can't do, that other people can't get away with doing, and it emboldens you to say and do things. And again, I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying I think that's something that does happen. And so then having Silver come out and kind of I don't know if he meant to phrase it the way that he did, but say that owners get to say and do things that other don't, others don't. It just kind of reinforces that type of thinking, and that just felt gross. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I you know completely agree with that. And in the uh, I I don't know if he wrote it in an article, but I know Vince Goodwill um, definitely um, tweeted or wrote something along the lines of what you were saying of like, hey, it's important to remember who Adam Silver works for. They, I think there's this misguided notion that Adam Silver fully runs the NBA as right. you know you know rules over it with an iron fist and everybody must do what he says because the reality is let's say he just started up and banning owners left and right well then the owners are all going to get together and they're going to vote and there's going to be a new commissioner in there tomorrow right it would be nope that's not happening so so that's where you know he only does have so much power but that said I'm not going to excuse it either for his side because I just I felt left very cold with his responses to this, we'll see what happens. My guess is where this goes from here, because now we've seen LeBron James, Chris Paul, two very prominent voices um, within the NBA, including Chris Paul being a Phoenix son, come on, basically say, hey, this wasn't enough. Uh, we saw the NBPA, uh, uh, Tamika Tremaglio, come on and say, um, like, not good enough. Like, we're we're not okay with this. Like, this, right. he shouldn't be here anymore. This is how you're going to get the public pressure, where you're going to get people to start to push and push and push. And the reality is, unless players do something, and unless sponsors start pulling out, and unless you have fans who start speaking with, right, you got to speak with your money by, all right, cancel my season tickets, or I'm not going to go, or whatever. Right. Um, and that's really hard, because you still support the Phoenix Suns, players right? right you still want to see them you know do well because they didn't they weren't the ones who did wrong here but if all that starts to happen that's how you get that pressure of all right you know you need to sell the team because now all of a sudden we're starting to head down a path we don't want to be down um so we'll see what you know happens and you know this is something that's going to continue to play out over the coming months probably over the coming years of you know where 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 does this go from here uh even after he has served his uh, one year suspension well uh, it's interesting that you know he spoke out so vehemently against the report when it first came out and, and asserted that he did nothing wrong and obviously that wasn't true based on sure. the the findings of this investigation but i also say this like it's it's something that I think we have to keep in mind. They were looking back, what was it, like 17 years mm -hmm, in I some of these so. instances? Like human memories are far from infallible. And so I think, you know, aside from, I, I don't know exactly what evidence was out there. Was there evidence that was on tape? Was there video? You know, whatever. But if some of it is just people saying, oh, I think I remember back then he may have said this, that makes it tough to issue like a lifetime ban or something to hit that level yep. when you're relying upon people's memories of something 17 years ago. And that's the difference between this situation and the Donald Sterling situation Correct. with Sterling you had 30 years. Plus you had him on tape fully, you know, vetted and known that it was him saying some truly vile things that then turned into, all right, well, now we have, you know, complete proof. And one of the things I was reading, uh, you know, a lot of times just like when there's an injury, we'll get the doctors chiming in yeah. on, on what may happen. We saw a lot of lawyers chiming in on this. And one of the things they said is if they tried to ban him, likely this would have turned into a, 
a um, legal battle, and they many of them seem to be in consensus of it would have been one the NBA would have been very hard pressed to win because it would have been as much as it can be. Trevor Keith and you know fifty of our friends all say the exact same thing. It doesn't. It's not proof. That still is hearsay. It's you know there. It's it's like they they always say you know if there's a, a car accident, you know ask twenty eyewitnesses, you're going to get twenty slightly different accounts, right? It was cloudy. It was sunny. It was raining. It was snowing. It wasn't like you know well this and that. The car was blue. One car was red, and those kind of things. And that's where I think to your point, you know, you hey, do you remember what happened in you know uh, 2005? Um, somebody might be like, yeah, I have a kind of vague memory of him saying, you know, some stupid thing that he said. Reality is he probably did say that stupid thing, but it's, you know, there's, there's not a, a tape recording or a video of, you know, all this stuff as far as we know. So that's, that's where I think the NBA was also very conscious of, we don't need a full scale legal battle here because there may not be one we win. And then it gets tied up and turns ugly for all parties involved. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Let's, let's move on. Yeah, let's talk hoops. Let's talk Dennis Schroeder. Um, still sitting out there as a free agent, but has played pretty well lately in Eurobasket. So what, what are we thinking uh, about Schroeder and his prospects on, on the market? Is he still pretty much relegated to just a veteran minimum if and when a team picks? I have to imagine somebody's going to pick him up, right? Yeah, someone's going to give him a veteran minimum, and they really should. He, even without the Eurobasket performance, which has been really, really good for him, he's been a huge part of uh, driving Germany all the way into the semifinals. It's been, a, uh, I think, for NBA fans on this side of the world, it's been a disappointing Eurobasket because it's Luka is out, Jokic is out, Giannis is out. All of the big major MVP level stars are all out. Sigh and, of uh, relief for fans of those teams. Then. To some extent, yeah. <laughs> right. They're going to get, they're, they're gonna get a couple weeks off here before camp starts. So, yeah. So, you do have that side of it. But I think um, there is a, a side of it where it's – um, it's been an unexpected tournament and a lot of teams that are, that are still playing weren't expected to go this deep. Um, but taking that aside, you know, I think you and I come from this from a unique perspective of having spent a couple years mm -hmm. in a row of watching Dennis Schroeder. Neither one of us are the biggest Dennis Schroeder fans, no. but I think, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, so jump in if I am. This is still a guy who should be on an NBA roster. Yes. Like I'm not, I'm not and, and more than a veteran minimum. Even, even knowing that he's not necessarily the key piece you want to become a winning franchise, he produces at a higher level than you typically would expect from a veteran minimum guy. I think he's a value on a veteran minimum. Yeah, you put him on your bench and say, hey, you're going to play 20 to 25 minutes a night, do your thing as a scorer, you're probably going to get pretty good production on him. I yep. always look at it and say, Lou Williams, Jamal Crawford carved out very long, very good careers by that being what they did. It was come in, shoot and score, do your thing. And that's where I think you could get to a Dennis Schroeder. Yeah, if you're saying, hey, come be our starting point guard for you know the, the whole season, it's, he's probably not at that level. But is this guy a top 35, 40 point guard in the league? Yeah, definitely, right? Which means that that puts him in the position where you're at least a backup point guard, you know, at a high level, you know, high end backup. And that's, that's where he should be. So now moving forward, he's probably not going to get more than a veteran minimum because the teams who, who have the ability to do that probably aren't going there uh, for him. But there's a handful of teams where you could see, all right, you know, let's go. I, I still think if the Lakers do something where Russell Westbrook is traded and they end up with kind of coming out of it with, all right, Pat Beverly's kind of our only true point guard option, mm -hmm. I think Schroeder could make a ton of sense for them in a role where it's, hey, come and kind of run our second unit, kind of be be the guy to do that, um, you know, with that. I don't think as a starter, I think Beverly's a better fit with what the starting group can use, but I think Schroeder could be a guy who could do that for them, and I think there's a handful of other teams too. Let's see, and he may be somebody who may be able to kind of, let me play this out a little. Let's see where things go over the next few weeks. And then I'll be able to, to kind of pick my spot and, and pick a place where I think I can really go and play. I, like Charlotte doesn't necessarily have a really good backup point guard uh, yeah. right now at the moment. If they want to run with him, that I think would be a good fit uh, for him there. Um, you know, So there's definitely spots where he, he could play. And I think it's going to be, let me get through Eurobasket. Let's you know get as far as we can here with Team Germany, and then I'll pick my spot after that, and then we'll see him pop up. Uh, you know, I camp with the team maybe a week or so in the camp. He was photographed with his son after a game recently. His son was wearing a Lakers jersey. In case you're trying, in case you're trying to read into 
anything. Make some connections. Yeah, and then he had that that uh, comment, the, the Instagram back and forth with LeBron not too long ago. By the way, did you know that Russell Westbrook listed his house for sale? No, I didn't. Every, everything no, means love, something these yeah. days. <laughs> I love nothing more. Than my, my favorite thing in the world is NBA real estate. Uh, oh my gosh yeah, yeah these it, guys you know it's funny because i mean some of these guys it seems like they're, they're like the property brothers flipping houses left and right so you know where else for sure to, would make some sense i think what about toronto their backup yeah. point guard right now is malachi flynn because they, they 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 don't have a veteran in there behind fred van vliet van vliet's a guy who's missed some time over the years so you especially the last couple of years so you might want to uh, maybe lower his minutes a little bit uh you know bring him down and bring shooter in there 15 20 minutes a night i think that'd be a really good fit there too yeah yeah i agree that's a good one that's a good one uh let's talk a little bit about exhibit 10 contracts and i i guess just to kick this off the the main thing is for fans when you're when you hear a player is on an exhibit 10 contract the best thing to do is just assume that that guy is not going to make your final roster. That's kind of, yeah. it puts you on a pathway to get cut, essentially, if you take yeah. an Exhibit 10 contract. But it says the team wants to hang on to you. So I think before we dive into a discussion here, just when you hear a player's on an Exhibit 10 deal, don't get too excited about seeing the player with with the big club. Just assume they are going to wind up on getting cut and being on this the G League team. Yeah, every few years somebody plays themselves off that it's and into a standard. Uh, probably the best example was Dwight Howard in uh, the, uh, his first, not his first, but his his like second Lakers run. Right, he's had three turns with the Lakers now. Am I right on that? So uh, yes, yeah. So his second Lakers run, he came in actually on wasn't it Exhibit Ten, but it was an Exhibit Nine, which is is in effect it's the same thing exhibit 10 is just some language around the g league which we're going to talk about here in a second but he came in on a non-guaranteed summer contract doesn't count against the cap or the tax that's another important thing with it, whether it be exhibit 9 or exhibit 10 um, they don't count against anything unless you make the team out of camp then it transitions into a standard non-guaranteed contract yeah. and begins counting against and dwight howard was basically the lakers said all right, prove it. Like, we're going to bring you in. You got to prove it. And he did, and he made the team, and there was a big part of them uh, winning the championship that year. So um, so that's, that's you know, probably the best example. Also, a very odd example of a player that deep in his career taking one of these right. contracts, but that was, you know, he was coming off some points where it was like, I think this guy might be done as an NBA player. And he proved, hey, I can be, you know, still a quality backup at least, you know, a couple years ago. So, Exhibit 10, though, as Trevor said, and it's really spot on, is don't get super attached to these guys because they're probably going to be cut. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened? So this just happened. I'll give the real world example. Micah Potter, he's a, a G League uh, center. He played with the Pistons on a hardship call up last year. The Pistons signed him to an Exhibit 10 deal. He filled their 20th roster spot. Remember, 20 roster spots allowed in the uh, offseason. Then he was waived immediately after that and the Pistons signed Kiefer Sykes but in his exhibit 10 uh, deal with the Pistons if he reports to and plays for the Pistons G League team for 60 days um, from the start of the time the G League teams come together and he's there for 60 days he gets a $50,000 bonus mm -hmm. doesn't go against the Pistons cap or anything like that it's just what he's paid to so that tends to be the standard with an exhibit 10 is there's a 50,000 guarantee given to a player if he reports to the team's G League team and then sticks around for 60 days. So what you will see teams often do is they'll sign a player, they'll waive him sometimes the same day, sometimes the next day, sometimes a couple days later, and they'll keep doing this because each team at the end of preseason is allowed to declare four players as affiliate players, and then those affiliate players go to the G League. They can also do something which the Pistons will likely do uh, with Potter, which is trade for their returning player rights. As he was a G League player last year, he actually played for the Sioux, Sioux Falls Sky Force, which is the Heat's G League team. They own his G League rights. So the Pistons will probably trade for them. Then he'll report to Grand Rapids Drive, which is their, their team. And then he'll play for them. Or it's not Grand Rapids anymore. I think it's Motor City Cruise, actually, is what it is. That, that's bad on me. There's a Grand Rapids Gold. Those are the Nuggets G League guys. So the Motor City Cruise, the Pistons G League team, 
he'll go there, play for them, and get his extra fifty thousand dollars after he spends sixty days in the G League. And you're gonna see this happen somewhere in the range of. 50 to 100 times yep. over the course of the next month as teams go through this. You will occasionally even see a guy get waived from an Exhibit 10, then claimed by another team or even signed um, by another team to another one because they're like, oh, hey, they let you go, but we really want your affiliate player right. So we're going to get you so we can send you to our G League team. And it's a way they stock their G League rosters with players they'd like to keep working with. Right. And if you're a player, the incentive to go to another team is if you see an easier path to the end exactly. game with with that that other team. The fifty thousand dollars is financial incentive to not go play in Europe or something yep. like that yep. um, is to stay with the team with their G League program. Uh, remind me, though, affiliate players, can they still be claimed by opposing teams? It can be. Yeah. So there's an, there's still unless you are signed. So there's a there, the G League is basically made up of. um kind of four different categories. There are um, affiliate players. There are returning rights players. There are G League um, free agents, which when a player signs with the G League, it's important to note, they actually sign with the league itself, not with the team. And then MLS like structure. Yeah, exactly. Then they're allocated to that team. And then there's assignment players. Assignment players are number one. All two-way players are considered assignment players because mm -hmm. they are shuttled back and forth. Then the other assignment players are like, like if you're, um, the know, Lakers I, want to get more minutes for Max Christie. Exactly. They send him down. Max Christie, exactly. they send him down on an assignment. Right. And he goes, assignment players, so whether they're regular roster players assigned down or they're two way players, they are, they belong to the NBA team. Nobody else can, can get them. Nobody else, you got to trade for them if you want them. Everybody else in the G League is an NBA free agent. And there's nothing teams can do to block them from signing when they're allowed in January a 10 day contract. Or um, if teams just, hey, we have an open roster spot, we have a need, we're going to call up a guy right now. There's nothing, you know, if, if a team says, you know, boy, I really want to get Micah Potter, you know, I need a big man, I'm going to sign him right now to come up and play. There's nothing the Pistons would be able to do to block that outside of, hey, actually, you know what? We have a roster spot. We'll sign you ourselves um, with that. There's there's nothing you can do. So that's, uh, you know, just it, it's more, it's financially is the tie beyond anything else. There's no uh, actual NBA rights to those players. I, I do wonder if that's something that's going to change with the, the next CBA because we're seeing the G League become, and, and this is, you know, by design, year after year, it's becoming a greater and greater legitimate path to the NBA and becoming more and more like a farm system. So I do wonder with the, with the next CBA coming in, do we see teams have more opportunities to sort of stake claim to a player and prevent them from being signed away by, by other clubs as they look to use the G League as more of a feeder system into the parent club? Yeah, what I would like to see them do and change to make the G League a little bit more legitimate, one, I think for these players, let's up that 50K to like 100K or uh -huh. something like that, make it more financially viable for those players and then what i'd like to see is the nba team so so we'll continue to use micah potter right because we're using him as our example here the pistons then have right of first refusal for something like five to ten days i don't know what the right timing is but if if the you know, lakers want to call up micah potter the pistons can say we're exercising our right of first uh -huh. refusal and for the next five to ten days We'll work on creating a roster spot. We're going to call him up ourselves. And then, then if they don't do it, then the player is free to go wherever they want to go. Maybe they lose that affiliate player status just from a team control standpoint. That's, I think, a way to make sure you're not truly blocking the guy from getting an NBA chance because he's going right. to have to get it uh, with another team. But you're allowing the team to, hey, we did make some level of investment in this guy. We would like to keep him around and keep working with him. I think that might be the way you can play this off because I think we're still a ways away from building out full minor leagues where sure. it is – Deal with this. The other cool thing, just just as an aside, and we'll probably talk about this in season, especially these clubs, more and more of these teams have purchased their own G League team and then moved them, or they are were already very close to the NBA team. They're using them like Major League Baseball rehab style assignments. Yes. Uh, the Warriors did this with Clay Thompson. They sent him down to Santa Cruz several times. Hey, go play with Santa Cruz for the next week because we're on the road. You're not going to be ready to play with us, so we're going to assign you to Santa Cruz. Play in some practices. I don't think he did get in any games with them, but go practice with them for, for a few weeks, and then we'll bring you back and back 
back. Um, you know, we, we call you back from assignment and come and nothing changes for Clay Thompson, but he's able to go get some work in and those kind of things while still being covered and being on the team and all that. Yeah. And I, li- I like that a lot because then they're in, they're in a controlled environment yep. with a team that's going to be running, not exactly, but similar schemes. Right. Yep. And so it, it makes sense to have them in that kind of environment and then to flip it around too. If you're a G league player, and suddenly Clay Thompson shows up and he's practicing with you. It just reinforces that there's this direct connection. Yeah, I'm close, right? I'm so close. Right, I- exactly. And, I, and I'm not saying that's the only thing because obviously yeah. you've, you've got guys getting called up and we've seen there have been some great videos have been circulating about the emotional reactions when guys do get called up. And like there's some great stuff out there. But And that was like the coolest thing last year with the hardship call-ups. The reason for them sucked and hopefully we'll never yes. have that again. But it was really cool to see – you know, these hundreds of players get this opportunity to go kind of live out their NBA dream uh, for, you know, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 days um, in some of these cases to get, get called up that wouldn't have otherwise. Right. Cause um, you know, when, when teams were down all these players due to, you know, um, health and safety protocols uh, to get these guys up. I also think it's cool too. We've heard some stories of, you know, NBA players down there getting in a workout G league guy plays really well against them. And then it's like, Huh, all right, maybe there's a little something more here than what we mm-hmm. thought. And now that guy gets a slightly different look. Um, I think it's good. Even a uh, good example from the Clay Thompson one, apparently Jerome Robinson, while he's with Santa Cruz, played well against Clay Thompson. And now he's on one of these Exhibit 10 contracts with the Warriors uh, in training camp this year. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see if he pops and makes it. I do think this year, I know we just went through this whole thing. It's pretty rare for a guy to go. Because of the way some teams are sitting on four or five open roster spots mm-hmm. still in my cab, normally it's about two to four of these guys on these Exhibit 10s. There's a couple teams with four or five or six guys on these. We may see more than usual pop onto rosters because just a reminder for everybody, NBA rosters maximum is 15 standard in two two way. But minimum is you, you have to have at least 14 guys yeah. except for two weeks at a time. So so there are a handful of teams that only have about 12 guys on standard contract that are going to get have to get up to that 14 uh, by the end of training camp. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Let's talk Utah Jazz. Yeah. Um, story came out recently. Uh, yesterday, I think it was, by uh, Tony Jones of The Athletic explaining that while uh, it basically given the Danny Ainge's reasoning for why he, you know, traded away Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert and everything. And I don't fault him for that. I think that was the right move. I think the general consensus was that it was time for the jazz to make that move. He just got a little bit further into the thought process. Mm-hmm. But what caught a lot of attention was um, Tony Jones saying that there are still talks going on. And obviously if you just look at the roster, you mentioned there can only be 15 players. The jazz have 17. So we know no matter what, the Jazz have moves that they have to make, even if it's just, hey, we're going to waive a player. Now, I don't see very many players on the Jazz roster that scream to me, you're just going to waive this guy and pay him to go away. But there are, the Jazz have moves that they still need to make prior to the start of the season. So while most teams are done with their business as of this point, the Jazz definitely are not and still have some things that they're going to have to do here. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, to your point. Yeah. And it's not only is it 17 players, it's 17 gar- fully guaranteed contracts mm-hmm. with the, the smallest number being Jared Butler at about 1.5 million. But he was just a the guy they invested a second round pick in last year. So he's probably not going anywhere. Um, And then the next closest is Stanley Johnson uh, at 2.3 million because all the rest of the guys, even if they're in that range, they're on like rookie scale deals or on long-term deals or whatever. So yeah, so they've got some work to do here. Now, the easy way to do it would be, uh, let's start looking, right? Boyan Bogdanovich, Mike Conley, Jordan Clarkson, Rudy Gay, maybe Malik Beasley. Do any of those guys have a real future in Utah? Probably not. So those are the names that are being mentioned consistently. Um, Tony, as you uh, uh, referenced, he linked um, the Lakers are apparently linked to Bogdanovich. Um, We talk about that more in a second here. But the other point was, um, I believe it was Ramona Shelburne on the jump. It's not the jump anymore. What is the NBA today? Yeah. um, Said uh, they believe the Jazz believe they have deals where they can get first round picks for most of those guys. No one's giving them a first round pick for Rudy Gay. That's not yeah. happening. But if you even get a second or two seconds out of that, that's fine um, there. So I would expect them to be very, very engaged. Let's talk Bogdanovich for a minute. I've seen some people be like, why would anybody even want him? Because this dude was good last year. Yeah. He averaged 18 points on almost 50, 40, 90 shooting. 
And he's like, a wing. He, Everybody yeah, wants wings. Yeah, he's six, yeah, legitimate six foot eight. He can really play two through four. Um, he's early in his career, he played a lot at the two. Um, now he's probably more of a pure three who can play some four. Um, but yeah, this guy is actually very, very good. So that's reason number one why if you need some scoring on your wing position, especially if it's a guy who, hey, if you're really good and you bring him off your bench, yeah. Now, my challenge with the Lakers is how in the world do you match salary in a Bogdanovich trade unless it's Russell Westbrook? Right. And that's that's where it gets really, really difficult. Um, and then you're talking, then it's not Bogdanovich. You're probably talking Bogdanovich and Clarkson, Bogdanovich and Conley, something like that. Well, and the Jazz can't absorb too much salary without going uh, with go, without going into the tax, yeah. which they don't yeah. want to go into the tax for a tanking team. Yeah, they're sitting about one point nine million. Uh, under the tax line right now and that's you're absolutely right they, that's 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 probably too close anyway they're probably looking more at like hey san antonio can you take rudy gay back like yo know, and we'll right. give maybe we'll give you a second or um you know indiana you want to help facilitate a deal and you eat some salary here and that gets us you know three four five million clear of the tax line or whatever it is but yeah i i, I wouldn't be surprised if this Whatever happens with any one of these veterans turns into a three-team trade where most of the salary ends up sitting with Indiana or, or San Antonio uh, versus coming back to um, Utah. I think it's key to note, too, and that's interesting that you could add the, the Spurs into the mix there, um, or the Pacers, I suppose. They also have cap space. But what I think is interesting is when we say, well, they think they could get first for a lot of these guys, that doesn't mention what's also coming back. Like There's, there's yeah. going to be some salary coming back as well. Yep. So is it the Jazz have deals that would get them a first, but the player that they're taking back has two years left on his deal or something? You know, you know what I mean? Like there's sure. different. It could be, oh, it's a pure expiring contract and, you know, for the salary matching purposes and they get a first out of it. Maybe that's the deal. But we d without knowing the player and the salary that with them that comes back, it's hard to say, oh, Jordan Clarkson is clear clearly going to net a first round pick. They might have to eat salary in order to get a first out of Jordan Clarkson, or maybe they don't. I'm saying there's a lot of there's a big swing there in value beyond just saying, oh, they think these guys could all net a first. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, I think some of that is that's exactly right. It's not a first for the player. It's a first for the player com combined with what they're they're gonna eat yeah. from that team as far as you know it goes. But yeah, ideally you'd like to trade Bogdanovich. In his 18 million, 19 million salary, uh, let, let me just make sure I get it actually right. 19.5 million dollar salary. You'd like to trade that away for a 15 million dollar salary, clear four million, get a pick in the process, and just keep things moving forward and just add, you know, throw, throw the pick on the pile, right? Of uh, of draft picks they have coming their way. But yeah, I mean, they're not done yet, and this doesn't mean this is all going to be done in the next two weeks before camp opens. Yeah, I think some of these guys will probably bring them in, and it'll probably be one of those deals where it's eh, you're kind of here but i don't know how much we're gonna play you right. right now we'll play you in the first few games but you know god forbid we win a couple of them then you're gonna go to the bench you know because that's not really what we're looking to do here so we'll 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 see you know where where that all goes from there but you know yeah it's uh interesting stuff still coming in utah for sure the tank race is going to be interesting this year it, it it seems like it's going to really ramp up especially with who could be out there uh, next year for teams to to pick in the draft but yeah they're going to be pushing to that bottom three four spots right. and you know right now i think we've got some pretty good contenders for them but i think we've got about maybe seven or eight contenders for you know three four bottom spots the good news is though then we're not sitting on 10 or 12 kind of crap teams in the middle like then it's basically everybody else is like all right they're playoff level team right um so you know the league really is this year it's pretty good teams. And then there's a bunch of teams that aren't very good. Um, we don't have a bunch of teams. No, of course, as the year plays out, some teams will gravitate towards just, well, that's where they landed and they don't really have much of a chance. And they're just going to be playoff fodder for one of the good teams. But I do think that that, that is interesting too. We're not starting from a place of, you know, all right, the league's got, you know, five teams that can actually win it, you know, 15 that can't and 10 that are tanking. I think it's more like, you know, you've got 12 teams that think they might be able to win then you know four or five that are kind of in the middle and then you know, the rest of the tanking teams now you mentioned that the jazz could go into the season with some of these guys and they don't have to make these moves right now they do have to do they do have to clear those that roster yeah. up though 
Yes. So there's some, they've got to shed two guys before yep. the start of the season, which again, still gives them time. We're, we're middle of September right now. They've got over a month to get this sorted out. So I'm not saying it's like their backs are against the wall. Oh my gosh, they have to find something now. Sure. No, they still have time, but yeah, my, my guess has been if they're going to do that, like, like, let's just say there's no trades coming for any of their, their, they, these veteran guys. I think just when you start looking at it, I think a guy like Stanley Johnson, because he was kind of a throw in to make the trade work for them to get Taylor Horton Tucker. Um, and then probably someone like the Leandro Balmaro, who was a throw in into the uh, Gobert deal. Those are probably the two guys. And then they, they just eat those salaries, but you ought to be able to find something else and not have to even be in that position. And then maybe you just keep those guys and say, Hey, come on in. You know, you can play 25 minutes a night for us. And you know, it's probably not going to be very good, but that's the goal here. We're, we're happy if that's the way it plays out. Lakers fans, I know we're going to get this question. No, the Lakers would not be able to sign Stanley Johnson if the Jazz were to waive him um, because sure. the league rules. If he got traded somewhere and then was waived, then yeah. they could, but uh, but can't do that. Uh, from the Lakers' perspective, Keith, I've said for a while, I don't see anything that Utah could send back in a Russell Westbrook trade that would entice me to part with both first-round picks. Yeah, I do you do you not feel both. the same way? Yeah, not both of them. Yeah, one of them, if you could do Russ in a pick for say Bogdanovich and Conley, mm-hmm. I think I probably do that. Um, I, I, th- I mean, that's a little bit different now that they have Beverly, um, but Conley was still good in the regular season was. last year, and you would hope, you know, all right, maybe by the time we get to the playoffs, then where you know he's down to fifteen minutes a night as a backup, um, and that's where we're at with him. But yeah, I, if you could do Bogdanovich. And Conley for uh, Westbrook in a pick, especially if you could do like like that pick is like top five protected, top eight protected, something like that. Done. I you know call I it in right too. now. Yep. Like two two picks, and even if you said all right, one unprotected, and then we're gonna heavily protect the second pick, I just wouldn't do it. I just that's that's too much, and that's too far down the line to start doing. Because really, the reality is none of those guys will probably be even in even in the league. No. By the time we get to when those picks are being made, and that would just leave me feeling too that that's too much. Now, Turner and Healed, that's a little bit of a different story, maybe because sure. you would be looking at right, they, these are guys, yeah, we will have for the next four or five seasons. Um, that feels a little bit different, but yeah, I would not do do both picks in that. But that's but yeah, I've seen a lot of stuff today just since you know they dropped in. The Lakers are talking Bogdanovich. This is where you would have been, you would have been easier to do something if you had held on the Beverly trade and then you could have used Horton Tucker Johnson you know I don't don't freak out and cancel the show forever but throw Austin Reeves salary in there but you could you could have thrown a ton of salary in there and gotten maybe to that number yeah. and gotten yourself Beverly and Bogdanovich but uh you know they already use their kind of I don't want to say big trade chip because that's Westbrook's salary is the big one but you use your best medium sized trade chip in in that one and it's not 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 criticizing it's not that it was the wrong move because i think beverly's going to help the lakers quite a bit i I think that's a huge upgrade for them but if you could have held a little bit longer the challenge is you would have to go even further out because beverly couldn't be traded with bogdanovich for 60 days after they acquired him so you would have to wait a little bit longer to make it work but they would have got there eventually now, of these players, I think Bogdanovich carries the most value in a, yes. in a trade. Out of, out of Beasley, Conley, Clarkson, uh, you know, even when you throw Vanderbilt into the into the mix and you know Rudy Gay, Bogdanovich carries the most value. So if I'm the Jazz and I'm negotiating with the Lakers, now the Lakers, of course, would want Bogdanovich. They need wing help and all that. Mm-hmm. If I'm the Jazz, I'm trying to construct a trade that doesn't include Bogdanovich. If I'm if I'm Utah and the Lakers might just say no, that's dead on arrival. We oh, know, like I'm trying to send you like Conley and and, and Clarkson, Clarkson or something, yeah. something like that, because you know you can flip Bogdanovich to a number of other teams. If you sure. say like if you go into a room of NBA execs and you say we've got a wing for trade, that that at this this stage of the NBA, that's like yelling fire in a crowded theater, right? Like you're going to sure. create just mass panic. Everybody's going to be bidding on that player, going to be trying to put in or a lot of teams anyway, will be trying to put in an offer there. So Bogdanovich being your most movable piece, I, I wouldn't surprise me if the Jazz tried to do something with the Lakers that doesn't include him because they know it's an easy trade for a number of other teams elsewhere. Whereas finding a landing spot for Clarkson, finding a landing spot for Conley, 
that might be a bit more difficult, especially given if we look at Conley, you look at the point guard market around the around the NBA. Sure. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. I do wonder if there could be maybe something where the the um, Lakers and the, the Jazz get together and they say something along the lines of, hey, what if we sent like what if we sent you all of it? And then they're free and clear of money because because Gay has a six point five million dollar player option for next year. Uh, Clarkson has fourteen point three million dollars. Um, uh, Conley is guaranteed fourteen point three million dollars. What if they said, "All right, we'll take one pick, Westbrook and none, but you have to take Bogdanovich, Clarkson, Conley, and Gay." Do you do that if you're the Lakers? Yeah. I mean, I, would, I, right? I I think I would do it. I think I would do yeah. it, especially if you're getting like, I've been of the mindset that if I'm the Lakers, I'm not too worried about that 30 million in cap space for next year. Because nope. you're you're effectively punting the season if you just stand pat, right? You know, most most likely. I mean, there's always chances that things sure. can work out differently yeah. and all that. But, but you'd be getting a bunch of rotation pieces there that you could add in. Yes, you would cannibalize your cap space for the next year, what are you really going to go get, right? I mean, if, unless Kyrie says I'm willing to take, uh, what, $13, $14 million pay cut, whatever it is, what versus his max compared to what the Lakers can offer, it, what you're going to be in the mix for Andrew Wiggins, maybe? You're going to yeah. be in the mix for Harrison and then, Barnes, and then maybe? you don't have any depth, right? right? Then you're right back to now we've got, we're back to three guys and no depth because you're going to have to renounce all of the guys, you know, Everybody. Beverly Brown, Brian Walker, all the guys you signed. Uh, this off season. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the one where I, I think, could that be the, all right, we made it work. We, we, we will take, you know, the uh, um, thing. Also now here's another important thing that 30 million in cap space. It's not going to be 30 million in cap space now because here's what happened. Um, this is to, uh, I'm going to get real nerdy here for a minute on the cap. So the salary cap went up to 134 million projected for next season. Yeah. It was at 133 million. LeBron James extension could was capped at 105% of this year's salary when the because that kept him under the max amount he could make. Now because the cap had gone up, his number comes in under that at the 105 anyway or that brought it right to the 105. Now what it does is because of that his extension is going to start at his actual max, which is going to be 50 something million. So 30 million in cap space is not happening for the Lakers next year. So that's just, you know, just something to keep in mind there. I don't think the 30, I think the 30 million that people keep throwing out is, um, how do I put it? That's a very optimistic. If everything is wiped out and all this stuff was there, they could get to 30 million there. That's absolutely true. Um, but I think, give a little bit more for LeBron and then a little bit more for all these other guys. If they stick around probably somewhere in the 15 to 20 range is more, more reasonable. Now you could say maybe they signed Damian Jones knowing, Hey, you're going to opt out. Right. Cause then we'll, we'll, we'll resign you anyway. And you're not really going to lose anything. Maybe that's you know where that's going, but just, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. I, I think it's um 30 million, I don't know how overly realistic that that is. I know it keeps getting thrown around. I just don't think it's going to happen. So I don't have the the Lakers salaries in front of me here. So how much is LeBron's salary really going up then? Just based on that. Extra Not all that money. much. It goes up to. Hold on. It'll go up to uh, about 46.9 because that's 35%. And he was projected at, at just 44.46 uh, before. But where it's going up. There is it go why he gets that is because of that it that 105 max doesn't trigger now because it was then now he can actually get his full max on it. So slightly different number. So it would be next year's deal jumps up to almost 50. Uh 46.9. Okay. So yeah, and it was going to be in his extension at a minimum about a little over 46. So it's almost you know slightly over a million more. And then it really it goes up about two and a half million ish um, from this year's number. So then I, I know you've got 5 million is, you know, in Max Christie and, and these other yep. plays, but why does that drop them down to 20 million in cap space then versus 30? So if, if you went through it with, let me, 
We're going to do this on the fly here. Now, not to get too far <laughs> into the weeds here, but but uh, again, this is this is this is breaking news to to me. So yeah, this, so, this could be really important for the decision making here. So if you if you factor in right, if you factor in Max Christie, Anthony Davis, LeBron, and then I'm just going to put Damian Jones in there. Say say he opts in. We're trying to get to like a low end realistic number, mm-hmm. um, and then the draft pick is where it will be major. Um, differences if they finish in the in the playoffs if they're a playoff team that cap hold is going to be somewhere between two and a half million to four million if they're not a playoff team that jumps up to be seven eight nine million i think the last time i ran the projections um they did not have, i think it was before the patrick beverly trade and i it wasn't 538 but it was one of the projection systems had the lakers as out of the playoffs uh-huh. so that's also factoring in a slightly bigger um, draft pick cap hold by about, I think it was, uh, let me double check this. Yeah, about four and a half million. So that's where you're starting to knock that number down closer to uh, that 20 million. Got it. So, got yep. It. Yep. And then if you did anything like, let's say it's, man, uh, Lonnie Walker was awesome. We want to keep him around. Mm-hmm. Then his cap hold is going to take away. You know, so it, I think it's still fair to say, let's say 25 million seems fairish. Um, you know, maybe, you know, but, but that's also without any further moves. That's if, you know, the roster is what it is right now today. And, and to me that the, look, you could say, well, 25 million is still a lot, but it's not enough not to go a get max a max guy. It's not a max contract. You're talking yeah. about getting a few players to me. It just further pushes me towards the, the notion that I'm not worried about sacrificing that cap space in the future. If it means facilitating a trade right now by utilizing that. Yeah. I, I would feel very different if I could get to Kyrie Irving's max number. Um, just and I'm using Kyrie because sure. just he's been linked to them so much. If I could get to his max number, which is going to be, again, it's going to be well up over forty million dollars, then I would feel very different. But there's almost no way to get to that number, even if you cleared everything about LeBron and AD. Because the other thing people forget is people start doing math, right? And I love it is because people are this interested, but they're like. LeBron and AD, let's just call LeBron 47 million just because I'm rounding it a little bit. And AD's 41 million. Well, that's only $88 million. The cap's 134 million. That should be $46 million in cap space, which should get us Kyrie. Yes, but then there's all these other things, roster spots. And each roster spot under 12 comes with a roster charge on it. Those are going to be, you know, a million plus next year, probably about 1.2 million each. So now you're talking 10 roster chargers. There's 12 more million dollars. Now you're down into the $30 million range. Then you factor in, well, they're probably not just giving my buddies here. He's got his cone off. So he's all happy today. <laughs> he's, all, he's, he's decided he's fully healthy. Congratulations, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, um, but yeah, they, um, the, uh, then, yeah, you factor in a guy like me, he's going to be bothersome now. Um, <laughs> you factor in Max Christie, Damien Jones, anything like that, keeping any cap holds for any free agents, that's how you start really chipping away at that very right. rapidly. And that's why these these max cap space numbers, when you hear them, they're never quite what uh, what they may seem like they're, they're, they are. You know, that's why you're going to really sit down. Like yeah, That's why I have a whole spreadsheet that does it for me, and I don't have to keep reworking it. I can just do it you know, when I need to. So what you're saying, just to sum it all up, it's all the stuff for Utah, for Russ and a first, do it, Rob, sacrifice the future cap space. Yeah, I think I would. Because again, <laughs> yeah, I not, not, yeah, I mean, that's a very long, long, long roundabout way to get there. But yeah, I think so. Because again, I've said this before, if I have LeBron and AD, my whole goal is to win a championship right now. And having all of those guys, um, Bogdanovich, Clarkson, Conley, Gay, Plus what you've added and lose Russ and Nunn, who we've never seen what Nunn's going to be in a Lakers uniform yet. And we already kind of know Russ, that that fit isn't great. You've added considerable depth to your team. You've built yourself back up to where you feel pretty good about it. Just I would I would go on if it was one one pick and all those guys. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you're the Jazz, I would do it too because then I get a pick and I'm free and clear of all that extra salary obligation for next year. The Clarkson, the Conley partial guarantee, and Gay, um, you know, all that stuff. I'm I'm free and clear of that. That's you know uh, what that that's about. $30 million of salary that I, I wiped off my books next year too. And I have an extra pick 
off we go. You know, they probably buy out Russ and, you know, everybody moves on, you know, relatively happy I would be my guess. Keith, I'm going to need you to uh, call up your Celtics buddy, Danny Ainge, and, uh, and nudge him in the right direction. Yeah, hey, do you do this move? Yeah, I mean, it just – you can't do a small trade because the Lakers don't have the ability to match salary in a small trade, so it has to be big. If you're going to do a big, yeah, get let, let's let them get all out of it. The other thing, too, is just like we saw uh, Taylor Horton Tucker used to go, go get Patrick Beverly – I know it kind of sucks having Clarkson and Gay salary on the books for next year over having cap space, but then you've got Conley. You would have Bogdanovich's bird rights if you stayed over the cap. You could resign him and Beverly, assuming that works out. You really have a good foundation of your team, and then you've got Clarkson. Uh, Clarkson and Gay are twenty-three million-ish in tradable salary for exactly. the year after, and you can put that together. Go maybe then you could still put something together to. It'd be real tricky with the hard cap, but maybe you could get close enough to do something to do a trade sign and trade for Kyrie or something like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, start figuring that stuff out. So it's, it's, it's definitely put you, I feel like in a much better place um, as far as this year and even next year. Cause to your point, I, I know there's the Lakers and it feels like it's, you know, Lakers and cap space is scary. I just don't think it's enough cap space to be that scary um, for the guys that are going to be available in free agency. And that's how you end up doing things like, Luol Deng and Timofey Mozgov for $30 million combined, which is never great no matter what. No, no, it's not. It's yeah. definitely not. It was, this was also this was also positive, and then you, and then you threw that in there. <laughs> hey, I, I can't, I can't, I, we can't live in the Laker you know, love land here for too long. <laughs> That's kind of the show. Come on now. <laughs> All right, let's let's wrap things up here before I need more dark storm clouds roll in. But uh, but appreciate everybody for watching. And for listening, make sure you do you do subscribe to us over on YouTube as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Till next time, everybody. See ya and stay safe.